just want to mention um, this morning we have an anniversary, a 40th anniversary. Uh, Amy's parents, Tom and Monica, are here this morning, and it's their 40th anniversary today. And so Tom and Monica, would you stand uh, so we can see you? <clears throat> yes, congratulations. <clears throat> well, today we are going to begin a study on the book of James. Uh, James is considered by many to be the most practical book in the Bible. <clears throat> um, today I'll be doing an overview of the book of James, taking a key passage uh, from each chapter. <clears throat> Without a doubt, one of the major causes of problems in the world today is immaturity. And uh, there's a need for people to grow up. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, we read, Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. So what is maturity? Well, let's begin by saying what maturity is not. Maturity is not about appearance. Uh, some people may just look mature. Uh, some people may just look more spiritual than other people. The fact is we can look real spiritual and not really be spiritual at all. We can put on a holy face and not necessarily be holy. Spiritual maturity is a matter of the heart. That's what God looks at. Also, maturity is not about achievement. Maturity is not necessarily related to what we accomplish. We can accomplish a great deal and still be very immature. Maturity is not about academics. Education in itself does not make us more mature. Maturity is not necessarily related to the number of degrees that we have. Also, maturity is not necessarily ab about age. In many cases, the older the individual, the more mature that person will be in their faith. But that is not always true. One can be a Christian for 50 years and not be mature in their faith. There is a bumper sticker that says, I may be getting older, but I refuse to grow up. Well, God says maturity is about attitude. It's our character. D.L. Moody said, character is what you are in the dark. Character is what we are when no one is looking. Reputation is what people say about us. Character is what God says about us. God says that it is our attitude that determines whether we are mature or not. God wants us to grow up and have Christ-like attitudes. So how do we measure spiritual maturity? We do not measure spiritual maturity by comparing ourselves to other people. We determine spiritual maturity by comparing ourselves to the Word of God. That's the standard, not other people. The word mature is translated from the Greek word teleos. Teleos could be translated as mature or complete or, or perfect. And, and James uses this word five times in these five chapters in James. Well, let's go to um, point number one. In the book of James, we find five marks of maturity. And number one is a mature, mature person is positive under pressure. 
In James chapter 2, verses, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, we read, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So how do we handle trials? The first test of maturity is how we re react to problems. Do they blow us away? Do we get nervous and, and uptight and, and negative? Uh, do we grumble and, and gripe? Are we angry most of the time? Christianity is not just a religion. It's a life. It's a Christ-filled life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. Life includes problems. And a part of, the, and a part of life means sol solving problems, facing them with the right attitude. In James chapter 1, verse 12, we read, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Number two, a mature person is sensitive to people. In, in James chapter 2, verse 8, we read, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture... Love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. A mature person loves people. When we love people, we are sensitive to their needs. A mature person is sensitive to people. That person doesn't just see his own needs. He or, she's, he or she also sees other people's needs. A mature person understands their pain. A mature person is not just interested in himself or herself. Being interested in others is love put into practice, and it's a mark of spiritual maturity. The Apostle Paul said something like this. He said, I may win all kinds of people to the Lord, or I may build great church buildings. I may be on television. I may give money to the poor. But if I do not have love, I'm just a clanging symbol. I'm just a clanger. In our home, we have a large wall clock that is about 100 years old. It's been in Sheridan's family for probably all of those 100 years. It has a pendulum. And if you wind it, if you keep the clock wound, the pendulum will, will sound uh, every half hour and every hour. It, it's, got a, it's a beautiful gong. Uh, the gong is a, a deep, mellow, and it's a soft gong. I, I just love the sound of it. It's very pleasant to listen to. Well, we have also another clock in our home. It is in my office. It is smaller, but also has a pendulum, and it gongs every half hour and hour. Well, the small clock is also a beautiful clock, but it's a clanger. It's a clanger. The sound of that smaller clock isn't anywhere near as pleasant as the sound of that larger clock. You know, without love, we are like that small clock. We are clangers. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 through 40, we have a description of what will take place at the judgment. And if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Matthew chapter 25, verse 34.
Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and, and feed you or, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe, uh, clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine you did for me. It is interesting that in the judgment described here, we will not be judged for how many Bible verses we memorize. That's a good thing. Uh, we will not be judged for how many times we were in church. That's a good thing. We will not be judged for how great a reputation we had as a Christian leader. But according to the judgment described here, the one thing we, we will be judged for is how we treated other people. Were we at all sensitive to other people's needs? Well, let's take a look at point number three. A mature person has mastered his mouth. In James chapter 3, verse 2, we read, We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. Well, one of the things a doctor will say when uh, we go in for an exam is, stick out your tongue. Well, the doctor uses our tongue to, to check our health. Well, God also uses our tongue to check our spiritual health. In World War II, there was a saying that went like this, lose lips, sink ships. Loose lips sink ships. A loose lips destroy lives. They hurt. Gossip is mouth-to-mouth -mouth recitation, not resuscitation, recitation. Recitation is repeating something that you have heard. Gossip is repeating that which may or may not be true. Self-control and tongue control are related. There's a connection. James chapter 3 compares the tongue to various objects. And we read here that our, our tongue is like a bit in a horse's mouth. You put a little bit in a horse's mouth, and that little bit can control the direction of the horse. The tongue is also like the rudder on a ship. A little rudder can control the direction of a large ship. The tongue is also compared to a, to a spark. A great forest can be set on fire by a little spark. Our tongues are very small compared to the rest of our bodies. But the tongue controls our lives. What we say directs our lives. What we say can destroy our lives. What we say can be a delight to people. Uh, what we say can also be very discouraging to people. Our tongues are a powerful force that can be used for good or for evil. Have you ever heard anyone say, I just say what's on my mind? Perhaps. What's on their mind should not be said. Not everything that comes into our minds should be spoken. 
the Bible says that that's not being frank, that's being immature. Remember the passage that says, be quick to listen, and slow to speak? In Ephesians 4, 29, it says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. It doesn't matter how long we have been Christian. If we cannot manage our mouth, we are immature. A mature person manages his or her mouth. In James chapter 1, verse 26, we read, If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. That's what the Bible says that that religion is worthless. Now, if I have memorized a thousand verses and have thoroughly studied every book in the Bible, and I never miss church, but I'm a gossip, my religion is worthless. You know, God takes this pretty seriously, this whole thing about controlling our tongue. If I say things that are not accurate, or, or if I exaggerate, or if I speak impulsively, my religion is worthless. The test of maturity is to manage the mouth so that no corrupt communication comes out of it. So what does it mean to speak the truth in love, or what is sometimes called tough love? Well, speaking the truth in love requires the right attitude. It requires the right timing. It requires the, the right place. It requires especially the right motive. Motive is huge. Number four, a mature person is a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. In James chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, we read, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. The question is, am I a peacemaker or am I a troublemaker? Do I like to argue? Am I a contentious person? Do I get defensive easily? Do I hurt other people's feelings? Much conflict is due to pride. In Proverbs 13, verse 10, we read that pride only breeds quarrels but wisdom is found in those who take advice. If an individual is filled with pride, you can count on it that there will be also a considerable, a considerable amount of conflict in that person's life. And that conflict may be internal, but in many cases there will also be conflict with other people. Pride may lead to conflict at work or conflict at church or conflict at, 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 in our home. Let's go to point number five. A mature person is patient. In James chapter 5, verses 7 through 9, we read, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble, don't grumble, grumble against each other, uh, brothers, or you will be judged. If anybody has to have patience, it's a farmer. 
He does a lot of waiting. He plants a seed, and then he waits. And he prays. And he hopes. And he expects. There are no overnight crops. Just like a farmer has to wait, sometimes we have to wait. We have to wait on God for answers to prayer. We have to wait on God to, to work in our lives. Patience is a mark of maturity. Whenever we run ahead of God, we usually end up in some kind of trouble. So patience is a mark of maturity, and, and so is prayer. And James chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 we read this, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. <clears throat> Elijah was a man like, just like us but he prayed earnestly, and God did great things. As we close, let's do a little personal evaluation. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about us. What matters is what God thinks about us. You know, I can fool you and I can fool others, and you can fool me, and you can fool other people, but none of us can fool God. He knows exactly what's in our hearts. And some, some of us may need to pray this morning, Lord, forgive me for, for lashing out at people when I am under pressure. Lord, I pray that I would face my trials in your strength. And some of us may need to pray, Lord, forgive me for being so insensitive to others, my wife and my children. Forgive me for being a clanging symbol. And some of us may need to pray, Lord, forgive me for my loose tongue. Forgive me for the rumors that I have passed on. And some of us may need to pray, Lord, forgive me for being a troublemaker. Forgive me for the pride that has led to conflict in my relationships with others. And some of us may need to pray, Lord, forgive me for being impatient. And forgive me for not praying as I ought. Let's pray. Father, You are the one that can enable us to, to make good choices, to make right choices. Our responsibility is to submit to you so that you can speak to us, so that you can lead us and direct us onto the right path. And so, Father, this morning we pray for a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Forgive us our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And have your way, Father, in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we are going to celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, we also call it communion. It's a time when we do a inventory. We examine our hearts and make sure that there's nothing offensive in our lives or in our hearts, offensive to, to God or even to people. And so I'd like to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to, to prepare our hearts for this time. 
It says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself be before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Well, at this time, I'd like to have the elders and Pastor Nick come up uh, and prepare for uh, our time of communion. I'd like to say, too, that you do, you do not have to be a member of this church to participate. It's important that uh, we all do a, a self-examination. Uh, it's important that we all uh, examine ourselves. So uh, if, if you know Jesus, um, you're welcome to participate. 